Hi everyone and welcome to CodeFX and the dawn of a new time for Java. <laughs> Java 11 has been released recently and there's been some confusion about what the release cadence and particular licensing and long-term support mean for the community and I thought I'd address this by ripping some slides out of the talk that I gave recently. So here we go, let's talk about all of these three things. Release cadence, which JDK to use and about long-term support. Uh, the slides are online at slides.callfx.org and if you tweet about this, if you have any questions, uh, use the hashtag javanext and I'll make sure to answer. Let's start with the release cadence. I'm pretty sure you know all the, uh, you know the facts, but let's talk about the background. So in the past, um, the idea was Java will have a lot of feature, uh, will have uh, big features like um, Java, uh, sorry, like Java 8 lambdas and like Java 9 smaller system and these kind of like flagship features, we're going to wait for that to be done, but we're going to aim for a two-year release cycle. And that didn't work out that great. <laughs> so uh, Java 7 took a long time, even though it didn't have any flagship feature, I think. Uh, eight, and, 8 and 9, even they took like three, three and a half years. And the reason for that is, of course, that as a developer, it's always hard um, to have something that is almost done uh, be pushed like in the next, into the future, particularly if you know that the future is like two, three years away. Better just to delay the release for a couple of months. And that happened repeatedly. And in the end, you end up with like three years release times. So this is a couple of downsides. Um, most of, first and foremost, that the features that are already done that you would like to use as a, as a regular developer, like I would like, like let's, let's, I want to use this feature that's upcoming, but we can't because we have to wait for something else to be done and that's of course not ideal. Um, it also means that it increases reaction time, that if a release takes two or three years, that means it's, there's hardly any time to make any public experiments. Um, everything has to be out there and done by the time a feature is ready, a release is made. Whereas if you have a quicker release cycle, we'll see that in a minute. Um, it's much easier to provide some basically a better version of a new API and then refine that while it's out there. Um, that also means that there's a lot of pressure on the developers because they want to, you know, they want to get their stuff uh, out there by the, by the next release. So someone's pointing them with a stick like, when are you done, when are you done? And nobody likes that. Everybody's gets grumpy from that. Now, if it hurts, do it more often. So we're entering the new world. Uh, we've got the fixed, month, fixed six month release, release cadence in March and September, a new release is made. And everything that's done by then gets shipped and everything else has to wait for the next release. Now, I want to point out one thing that, and these are not, not none of these are beta releases. Like 9 is not 11 alpha and 10 is not 11 beta. All of these uh, go through the same uh, quality assurance process. So all of them are fully fledged features. How is that implemented? Well, first of all, why is that important? Uh, we're going to see that when we talk about long-term support. But how does it work internally? Um, when I use the terms master and branches, the JDK uses uh, different repositories for that, not just plain branches, but it's, it's, it makes more sense, it's easier to grasp if we just talk about regular branches. So a feature like, let's say, var that came out in Java 10 is developed in a branch. When it's almost done, it gets merged, that branch gets merged into, merged into master. And then three months before a release is made, a release branch is cut. That means that Java 10 came out in March, and I think the release branch was made in... Um, in December, so var has to have been ready by December 2017, so it could be in the release branch that was then um, later released in March. In these three months prior, all the security fixes, all the bug and performance fixes are made on master and then happily merged down into the release branch, but every new feature just ends up in master and will not be merged. So that means that completed features get out much earlier. Basically, you have be when it's ready, then it's maximum three to nine months um, before it's out there. And that's pretty cool. That's the biggest upside. That as soon as someone's, something's done, um, we can start using it a couple of months later. That means that JDK developers are under no pressure to, to, to finish something on time because then it would take like two, three years before the next release gets out. Um, but I think what's also overlooked detail is um, the way that this can be used to incubate features. So there's uh, two concepts that are new in Java. There are incubating modules, which can contain APIs, and then there are feature previews, which can even cover languages. And there are guardrails put in place that prevent you from misusing these in a way that cause incompatibilities when you make updates. Although I will show you in a minute, I'll discuss that in a minute, you can even you can misuse that, but by and large, um, the idea is here that we show you something or the JDK team shows us something uh, that is done, but maybe there's still improvements to be made, maybe some more refinements. People should start using it and then give feedback. And then that feedback can be taken into account and then it takes maybe another release or maximum two releases for this to be properly stabilized and standardized. And from then on, it's free to use for everybody without any additional flags or anything. And that means that it gets much easier to react to changes in the ecosystem. Uh, the JDK team can uh, see something new is happening, can provide something to try it out for you or for us, and then can uh, refine it and then can stabilize it. All of that can happen with, within like a year or two. 
So then there are some worries here and I'll address them one by one. Uh, Java will change too fast. Uh, there will be constant migrations, which are a lot, very expensive. Uh, exploring test matrix and then the fragmenting ecosystem. I want to, as I said, discuss each of them. Uh, I think we shouldn't panic. This is like, don't panic! No, seriously, don't panic. <laughs> this, this, will be, this is fine. This will be fine. Um, so, fast change. Uh, Mark Reynolds put it best. Uh, the rate of innovation doesn't change. The rate of innovation delivery increases. That means th that uh, the amount of new things that you're going to see are not changing in total because the limiting resources here are the JDK developers and nothing much change there. So uh, Oracle says that uh, you will see the same amount of change of the same amount of time, but you will see them in smaller chunks. Now, my personal opinion on that is that I think speed will pick up a little bit um, because uh, projects like Project Amber, particularly Project Amber, are targeting some lower hanging fruits. And I think you will see those quicker, so it will feel like pace is picking up because we'll see a couple of smaller features. Um, I mean, not like virus, not easy to implement, but it's sure a lot easier than Lambda or module system or value types. I also feel like Oracle is shifting a little bit from maintenance to evolution, uh, manpower as well. So I have the feeling that there's, that's why there uh, will be a little bit more development speed, but no radical change there. So I would say evolution will be steadier, not faster. Java 11, for example, is a pretty it's a good release, contains a new API, contains a lot of internal changes, but like, it's not groundbreaking exactly. And we're going to get used to that, that there will be lots of smaller releases and less of a few um, major releases, groundbreaking releases. Let's talk about expensive migrations. So yes, if you've upgraded to Java 9, then uh, that was tough. I agree. But the upgrade from 9 to 10 is pretty easy and from 10 to 11 just as well. So uh, don't worry, this, this will not become the norm. And if you are coming from 8 and want to go to 11, then check out the link in the description box uh, to a blog post I wrote about that. It has you covered on all ends of this, uh, technically as well as um, release stuff, uh, release cadence and licensing that we're going to talk now. By and large, Oracle is still committed to backwards compatibility, just as they were in the past. But there's also tension between compatibility and evolution. And I think that's in, that, in that tension, Oracle is moving a little bit more towards evolution. Uh, you can tell, for example, at the deprecated annotation, they got a new field for removal. So that means deprecations are no longer just squiggly lines. Now actually stuff can go away and will go away and already has gone away, which I think is not a problem at all. Uh, quite the opposite. I welcome that some of the things are, that nobody is using or should be using anymore are slowly moving out of the JDK. Then you may be uh, got a lot of promises about stuff that takes one major release. For example, deprecations can be removed in the next major release which sounds much more bearable if the next major release is 36 months away, not six months. So that shift also means that old things can go away quicker. Then you have the increasing bytecode level, which may seem like a technical detail, but a lot of um, tools like ASM, for example, work on bytecode and rely on the bytecode level um, to determine whether they can work on this on the specific piece of bytecode or not. And if that increases every six months, and maybe even the bytecode changes every six months, then that means that lots of these tools can now we're really having the dawn that I promised, right? <laughs> that lots of these tools um, can, will have to be updated every six months. And new versions will surely be released, but that also means that you have to put these versions in the right places. For example, the Maven's compiler plugin um, uses ASM, and for a while you had to uh, update its dependency on ASM to keep using that version of the compiler plugin on Java 11. And so this kind of stuff, like how do I update my transitive dependencies, my tools dependencies, uh, this kind of knowledge will come in handy in the future as you might have to do it a little bit more often. Finally, there are incubating features uh, that, so you have uh, um, the incubating modules and the feature previews. And as I said, there are guardrails put in place, but if you like really wanna, you can start misusing them in a way that makes your code harder to migrate, but that would really surely be self-inflicted pain. Um, there are guardrails in place that keep you from doing that. There we go. So, remedies. Most of these are obvious, so I don't want to go into details on this. Just on the standardized behavior, stick to that, which is easy said, but not always easy done. Um, you know this, right? You, you have a problem, you don't know exactly how the JDK behaves, so you try it out and then you make a decision based on that. Normally that's cool, but if you realize that, wait, the code that I'm going to write now, the decision I'm going to make now is going to shape the code over weeks and months to come, there's going to be a large body of code that depends on this detail, and then maybe take the time to look up whether the, the, the behavior that you observed is actually standardized, whether that behavior is promised. Because if it's not, then you might accidentally depend on the implementation detail, and if that changes, then you have to change all that big body of code that I talked about. So, when you make one of these decisions, and it seems to be important, have a look maybe at the Java language spec or at Javadoc at least, and uh, try to come up 
uh, try to come to a conclusion whether this is ob just observed or um, standardized behavior. Keeping everything up to date, also easy said, uh, maybe not that easy to do, but that will come in very, very handy here. If you just keep stuff up to date, you can just update all of your dependencies when a new Java version comes out. And chances are you have not even uh, realized that you had some migration troubles, uh, potential migration problems there. Finally, consider using JLink. With JLink, you can uh, create an image which contains your API and also, sorry, your, your code and also uh, the stuff from the JDK that you need. So if you deliver code to customers, uh, then you don't have to face the fact that they have like dozens of JDKs, different JDK versions installed across all your, you know, your users or customer base. Um, with JLink, you can give them a binary image which contains the JDK version that you feel most comfortable with. But there's a trade-off because then you don't get any security or bug fixes by, when they update the JDK. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, that would be um, a discussion for a different video. But look at, take a look at JLink and consider using it to reduce migration pains. Now let's talk about testing, the test matrix that's going to explode. So if you have total control over everything that you're using, then uh, including the JVM that you're running on, because maybe it runs in, a, in the cloud that you use, then, then that's pretty, pretty easy, right? You just pick the Java version that you're most comfortable with. You still have an incentive to stay up to date for performance reasons and for security reasons, but by and large you can pick the version that you prefer and you're not forced to test across the very different, many different versions. If you ship code to users, maybe you're developing a library or a desktop application or backend that users can use, then you're of course in a different situation. And then yes, you might have to uh, test against more versions. When it hurts, do it more often. It comes in handy when you know how to automate the stuff. When you um, when your the two entire pipeline is set up, that uh, new build maybe takes like two lines in configuration file, and that's so much easier um, than if you have a build engineer to spend an entire day on that. Then about the fragmenting ecosystem, there's the, um, some people say that it will just be like Python 2.3, which is the prototype of fragmentation, uh, where lots of libraries said they're not going to support three. And so entire project state will sit on two for years and years. And I think this is just not going to happen here. Uh, so many of the important um, projects, like all the IDEs, all the bytecode manipulation tools, all the build tools, um, all the big, big frameworks, they all already work on 9, 10, and all they're getting, getting out the 11 compatible versions now. And I know of no project that said, um, this has been too hard on us, we're going to stick with 8, so don't worry there. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this will be, um, that this will not going to happen to Java. So now I'm here to say, like, really, don't panic, <laughs> don't worry, uh, this, this really will be fine. As a general advice, um, find a suitable update cadence that fits your project. Talk to all the stakeholders, get them together, um, users, um, management, developers, and decide, uh, discuss the upside and downsides for your specific project and pick something that works best for you. But my recommendation is, regardless of what you decide, build against each Java version as it released, ideally even against early access builds, which are always available. Java 12 early access build is available, I think, for a couple of weeks now already, so you can already build against that. Keep everything up to date and heat deprecations because deprecations now mean stuff can actually go away. Use the jdeprecan tool for that. It's, it's in the, the bin directory in each Java version. And even if you can't build against Java 12, use the jdeprecan tool from Java 12. And it will tell you uh, which APIs you and also your dependencies are using. So it works on bytecode. It analyzes it and tells you which APIs that you and your dependencies are using are deprecated. And it will also specifically point on the ones that will be removed. Uh, so if you do that, you'll know in advance uh, what to look out for. That was a release cadence. That was the biggest topic, uh, or the longest at least. Maybe the most important one though is this one, Open JDK versus Oracle JDK. Uh, I cannot stress this, this, this topic enough. So, Sun and Oracle JDK, Sun and Oracle, sorry, used to uh, create a JDK that was different from the Open JDK version that you could download somewhere else. So it used to contain more features. It was perceived as more stable, even though I personally can't speak to that. And it was perceived to be more performant, which I know is uh, true in specific regards. For example, the Java 2D renderer, which underlies AWT and Swing, was faster in Oracle JDK 8 than in Open JDK 8. So as of Java 11, Open JDK and Oracle JDK are technically identical. There's a small asterisk there because they're not 100% identical, but the difference are totally negligible. Um, these two are um, identical for 99.9% .9 of use cases. The only difference between them basically is the license and support model, which we're going to look at in a minute. But first, let's see where you get these two JDKs from. So, code is developed in the OpenJDK repositories, and Oracle builds the OpenJDK repository and creates an OpenJDK which the with a GPL and ClassPass exception, so it's the free version, as in Freedom and Beer, and publishes them at jdk.java.net. This should totally be your default when you download JDK. Go to jdk.java.net, don't go to the Oracle download sites. It's still built by Oracle, it's still the same code, 
it's just a different license. So download the code from OpenJDK. Oracle's JDK, and that's what the big orange warning box maybe should put should say more clearly that Oracle put on the download pages. Oracle JDK is fully commercial. So from day one, you would have to pay Oracle if you want to use it in production. Most people don't want to do that, so don't use Oracle JDK. Um, use OpenJDK by default. As I said, it's technically identical. Also, it's the free version. Um, and I think that's great. This shift is great for the community because it clearly puts the free variant of Java top, first and foremost, and then um, the, the, the branded versions by different vendors uh, come below that and they all stand side by side or connects to all the other ones. Now let's talk about long-term support. Oracle gives free support for the current OpenJDK version. You will only get support for OpenJDK 11 uh, for six months. If you're paying Oracle for commercial support, you will get long-term support for selected versions, 11, 17, 23, and so forth, every three years. We get um, so long-term support for these versions. That means there is no free long-term support by Oracle, which used to be rather, rather shocking. I think at this point in time, everybody knows about this, but still. Um, remember, no long-term support by Oracle, which I think is fair, because long-term support actually costs a lot of money. And uh, I mean, yes, it costs money to pay for it, but it also costs a lot of money to do it. Uh, so it makes sense that Oracle wants to get paid for that. So how does Oracle handle um, these kind of fixes? How does this work? So uh, most of these fixes are developed on master out there in the OpenJDK. So Oracle's fixes are available for everybody to use. Then Oracle fixes, sorry, merges this fix from master into the release branch for the current OpenJDK release. So at the moment they would merge a fix from master into the 11 branch, but not in the 10 branch anymore. Now, if 11 is long-term support, then they will even two years down the line, they will still do this merging from master into their release branch, but that will happen internally, not in OpenJDK. That's important. So the fix is out there. It's merged to the current release by Oracle, but the merge to the old LTS release that is done internally, and you will only see that fix if you um, pay Oracle for it. So that means support also means that you can call somebody, but as a developer, I'm not that interested in that. To me, LTS means these fixes are merged um, from master into the version that I'm currently using. And you don't have to pay Oracle for that. If you don't want to, you can pay different people. You can pay IBM, Red Hat, Azul, and maybe there are more companies than that. So you can pick different vendors and they will basically do, the, do similar things. Um, they will apply fixes to the selected versions that they provide long-term support for. And I think most of them are using the 11, 17, 23 um, increments that Oracle is using as well. So what are free long-term support? Will there any, be any OpenJDK version um, that gets more support than just the six months by Oracle. And current discussions on the mailing list are very promising. It looks like um, the community at, uh, as a whole will apply these fixes, just uh, apply these mergers just as well. Um, maybe into the stewardship of some company, it could be Red Hat for Java 11. And in that case, uh, the OpenJDK release branch for 11 uh, will always contain all the fixes, at least for the next four years. And if that comes to be, then it's great that Adopt OpenJDK is there. Uh, that's a project, basically um, a group around a big, a big build farm. And they will pick all these changes up. They'll pick all the OpenJDK um, branches and will build them for all kinds of platforms. So for example, 32-bit is something that Oracle doesn't offer as an OpenJDK download. Adopt OpenJDK will most likely end up doing that. So this looks like the community will get together and will provide about three years of long-term support for these OpenJDK versions, which I find is great. And there's great ways to participate. Um, if your company has um, some, some computing power left over, you can slave to one of the OpenJDK build farms and you can help them build stuff. Uh, if you have a JVM hacker along uh, in your lines, encourage them and support them in maybe applying these fixes, give them a, a couple of days uh, a month uh, to do that. So there are various ways that you can, uh, that everybody can participate in this effort to provide support by the community for the community for selected OpenJDK releases. So uh, let me end with a quote from Andrew Haley from Red Hat. He said, let me assure you of one thing, whether by Oracle or Red Hat or someone else, JDK LTS releases will continue to be supported. We all have a lot invested in Java and we won't let it fail. And I think that would be really cool if we end up in a situation um, where OpenJDK will get this kind of support. So, in summary, the new release cadence can cause, will cause a little bit more work, but I think it's totally worth it because we get a lot, of ex we get a lot in exchange. Particularly, we'll get stuff sooner when it's done. OpenJDK became the new default, which I think is awesome because it's the proper free version of Java. And if we even manage to give it three years of support, 
uh, that would be just plain awesome. And that's for me. If you have any questions regarding this, as I said, tweet about it. Um, or write a comment down below. That would be great. And then, you know, do all the internet things with follow and subscribe and like and bells and whatever. <laughs> Bye.